So here we are in the middle of stewardship season, and we're talking about joy. Today it's joy in what's to come, but we don't really know <coughs> what's to come. And oftentimes that causes anxiety, or it causes us to fixate on the past and to stay stuck in old patterns. But there's no joy to be had in the past. Joy can only take place in the present. I believe it was the late, great Joey Jeter who told me that ministry is in the interruptions. It was my last semester of seminary, and I was just ready to be done had a new baby, and I was tired. And I had so much to do, and I was complaining about how something at church had sort of interrupted my week, my plan to get everything done. God is in the interruptions. And if we pay attention, just in the middle of our messy, chaotic, beautiful lives, we just might find joy. My son, Matthias, is now almost 18, next month, the baby that I had in seminary. I know, he's going to be 18. And I was talking to him about it this week, and I said, you know, Matthias, the greatest gift you gave me was teaching me how to just stop and pay attention to beauty. I remember when he learned how to walk, just following him, wherever he wanted to go, as long as he was being safe. And just sitting down and looking at grasshoppers and flowers and leaves and seeing them almost again for the first time through his eyes. So beautiful. What's that? What's this? Children help us to be present to our lives. Children point the way to joy. What is to come? We have no idea. We have no way of knowing. It's hard to wrap our heads and our hearts around this notion. The, disciple, the disciples struggled with this too. So I want to turn now to John 16, verses 16 to 24, when Jesus is hinting at his own death and resurrection. And they are struggling. He says, A little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying to us, A little while, and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They said, what does he mean a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, A little while and you will no longer see me? And again, a little while and you will see me? Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn. But the world will rejoice. You will have pain but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. 
friends, the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks be to God. Receiving joy. Sounds like the kingdom of heaven to me. Perhaps it's as simple as just paying attention to life, even in the interruptions, to discover a little bit of joy. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, I think he's trying to tell us to pay attention. He compares it to a lost coin or a treasure in a field, to a pearl of great price, a treasure, a party. The kingdom of heaven is a party. And when Jesus throws a party, he says, go out and invite people who can do nothing for you. Nothing in return. The poor, the lame, the blind, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, because these are the ones who will help you pay attention to life. Go out, invite people you probably want nothing to do with, and have a party, and you will have joy. So, Tony Campolo is uh, a great preacher, theologian, writer, and Christian, my husband and I, have become friends with his son, Bart. And uh, so when Tony was coming through town, this was years ago, uh, Christian and I went to hear him preach. And he told one of my favorite stories. Uh, the name of the sermon was the same as the title of his book, The Kingdom of Heaven is a Party. And he told us the story of Agnes. So he says, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of Honolulu, there I was at 3 a.m. looking for something to eat. Well, that's a strange thing to be doing. But Tony is from the East Coast, and he had just gotten to Hawaii. So he hadn't adjusted to the six-hour time difference. And his stomach said, it's time to eat. It's breakfast. So there he is, alone, wandering the streets of Honolulu, looking for breakfast. And the only thing he can find is one diner with a light flashing open on a little side street. And he gets in and he says, to call it a greasy spoon would be to put it kindly. He said it was dingy and, and it smelled of grease, but I was hungry and they had coffee. So he sits down at the counter and he asks for a cup of coffee and he sees a little pile of donuts uh, there on the counter. So he asks the man, can I please have one of those donuts? And the man just reaches with his hand and grabs the donut and sets it on the plate. No tongs. It's a greasy spoon. So he's sipping his coffee and dipping his donut in it, and uh, he's happy to have found something to eat when the door opens and eight or nine very loud women come in to this small diner and proceed to sit up at the counter with him on either side on the stools. And suddenly this place that was quiet and dark is alive with noise. And it doesn't take him long to realize that uh, these women are just getting off work. And that their work is prostitution. And they're talking about how tired they are and how much money they made and how they can't wait to get home and go to bed that they need something to eat. And Tony says, I'm just about to ask for my check and get out of there because I am feeling very uncomfortable. Right there, in the middle of all of these prostitutes. And that's when the woman next to him speaks up and says, you know what, tomorrow is my birthday, y'all. I'm going to be 39. And then the woman on the other side of Tony looks at her and says, Agnes, who cares? What do you want, a party? On a birthday cake? What do you think, you're special? And Agnes says, well, why do you have to be mean? 
I've never, ever had a birthday party. Can you just be nice about it, at least? Whatever, Agnes. And they finish eating, and Tony's sitting there, just taking in the sadness of these women's lives. And he decides something in that moment, so he sits and he waits for them to finish. And they leave the diner, and he looks at the man behind the counter. He introduces himself. I'm Tony, he says. And the guy says, I'm Harry. Harry, did those women come in here every night? Oh, yeah, 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 every single night, like clockwork. All right, so they'll be here tomorrow? Yeah, and the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. Okay, Harry, do you know the woman's name here that was sitting right here? Yeah, that's Agnes. That's Agnes. And Tony says, I have an idea, Harry. What do you say we throw a birthday party for Agnes here tomorrow morning? She's turning 39. And all of a sudden, a woman from the kitchen comes out, I love it. That's a great idea. It's Harry's wife. Yes, I love Agnes. Let's do it. I'll bake the cake. Okay. So Tony says, well, I'll, I'll get some decorations, and I'll come a little early. What I need from you all, other than the cake, is to uh, make sure that other people come. Invite them so that it's not just me and these eight or nine women. You all invite whoever you want. Let's, let's pack this place. Let's do it right. And so all of a sudden, Tony's pretty excited. And he spends the next 24 hours finding crepe paper and making a sign, Happy Birthday, Agnes. And at about 2.30, the next morning, he gets up, goes in, has his coffee and donut, and decorates the place with crepe paper and a sign. And pretty soon, the place is full with a bunch of strangers. Tony doesn't know them. And just like clockwork, right at 3.30, the door swings open, and in comes Agnes and her friends and they break into song. Happy birthday, Agnes! And Agnes is stunned. Her friend has to hold her up. She can barely stand. And then, when the woman comes around the corner with the lit candles on the birthday cake, she just bursts into tears. She can't even blow out the candles. So Harry blows them out and hands her a knife and says, Agnes, cut the cake. We're all here for you. We want to eat cake. Let's go. Come on. And Agnes is just holding the knife. I, I can't cut it, she says to Harry. Why? Because I've, I've never seen anything so beautiful. And she hands the knife to Harry, and, and he hands her the cake. She says, can I just hold it for a minute. Can you all just wait for just a second? I just want to go down the street. It's two blocks away. I want to show this cake to my mom. She's at my apartment. It's your cake, Agnes. Do whatever you want. And so he says it's as if she's holding the holy grail as she walks out with this birthday cake. And there they are in the diner, just in kind of stunned silence, looking at each other. And Tony finally steps up and says, I think we should pray. And so they all grab hands, and they thank God for Agnes, for her life. And Tony asks God to bless her with joy. And they pray for the gift of life, and they ask for God's blessing. And he says, amen. And Harry looks at him and says, wait a minute. You didn't tell me you were a preacher. What kind of church do you go to? And Tony says, I thought about it for a minute, and then I swear the Holy Spirit gave me these words. I go to the kind of church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. And Harry says, no, you don't. Because if there was a church like that, I would go. There, in the middle of the night, 
in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a greasy spoon diner, the kingdom of heaven breaks forth. And there's joy in the strangest of places with the strangest group of people. How does this happen? I think it has something to do with a willingness to sit in the midst of discomfort and unfamiliarity and just the strangeness of life and pay attention. Be love. Be willing to have our hearts open by strangers and to see life as a gift and celebrate it whenever and wherever it breaks in. The kingdom of heaven is a party. Jesus compares in this scripture the waiting, the longing for joy to a woman who's in labor. It's familiar to them. This is the narrative of the Old Testament. God's people waiting for salvation is like a woman in labor. They know this metaphor. There's the work, the suffering, and then the new life. And then this beautiful promise, right there in the middle of the scripture, if we're paying attention, is the promise that we long to hear when our hearts are broken, when we have just lost someone, when our world has fallen apart, he says, so you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. That is our deepest hope. And perhaps the greatest hope of someone who's never had their lives celebrated is a birthday party. It's a strange thing. What we discover when we pay attention to life. It can be beautiful. And it can be from the most unlikely of people in the most unlikely of ways. They're in the middle of pain. They're right there in the middle of suffering. That's what the cross is about, friends. The cross represents the very worst that humanity is capable of doing and the most loving response of God. This is where transformation happens. Great love and great suffering birth new life. Our deepest longing is held right there, in the midst of loss, always available, always pouring itself out, always birthing new life, if we pay Attention. We find joy in what's to come right here, right now. There is a celebration underway, and we are all invited. Amen. <laughs>